Hello and welcome to 15 Minutes on Sparkling Wines. Now, Australia may not come to mind immediately for many uh, sparkling wine drinkers as a great place for sparkling wines, but it really should. There's a long history and a great heritage of very, very fine wines and some fun and affordable wines for that matter. Um, so today we're going to have a look at a little bit of the history. Um, it dates way back to the 1880s when the Victorian Champagne Company produced its first quote unquote sparkling burgundy. So yes, a little loose with the terminology back in the 1800s, uh, a champagne company in Victoria making sparkling burgundy, but that's just the, name, the way names were back in the day. Then we had a gentleman that started using um, uh, Shiraz to make sparkling red wines, which we're going to talk a bit more about that later, but that's a uniquely Australian um, style. And then that was carried on by Sepples, and they take over the Great Western Winery. And this is a really important piece of the puzzle because a gentleman called Colin, Colin Priest started this long tradition of um, very good sparkling wines at Sepples Great Western and also very, very good sparkling red wines. And again, we'll, uh, we'll address the sparkling Shiraz story in a moment. This carried through. I mean, there was a few decades in Australia where the vast majority of wines being consumed um, domestically and frankly exported were fortified wines. Um, but sparkling wines continued to be made and then a little bit of momentum in the 50s. But frankly, it was sort of around the 1980s, late 1980s, when uh, Moet Chandon uh, decided to settle in uh, Yarra Valley and start making Australian sparklings. And then other producers started to really focus in on making high quality traditional method wines and today it's a really really exciting time for very good quality sparkling wines across the board in many many areas in uh, in australia all sorts of methods being used for the production of sparkling uh, wines in australia straightforward carbonation tank method the method ancestral or the ancestral method which you know the extension of that is the pet nats which are kind of all the rays uh, the rave nowadays transfer method but the real high quality wines tend to sit in the in the category of traditional method basically using the same methods and techniques that are being used in champagne and frankly quite often the same varieties uh, so speaking of varieties all sorts of varieties are being used we actually have a very uh, sort of uh, bustling trade in uh, in prosecco so the great prosecco being used in in australia for domestic uh, uh, consumption a lot of that being produced um, all sorts of different varieties are being used and again shiraz being one of them we'll talk about that in a moment but when push comes to shove chardonnay pinot noir and pinot meunier are really key for the production of some of our very best traditional method wines And the nice thing is that it's across the board in Australia, as it is in, in, in several countries that uh, do produce uh, sparkling wines. There's fun and affordable, easy drinking styles. Uh, we've got high quality, age worthy wines that frankly can rival top champagnes. And the wine guest winemaker, Ed Carr, who I'll bring on shortly, he's one of the guys responsible for some of our finest quality, um, um, age worthy uh, traditional method wines. And then we've got these unique sparkling red wines. And let's have a quick look at that. Um, I don't think we're unique in Australia in producing red sparkling wines like Brusco and there's some other styles around the world that are being produced, but we are unique in the set in the sense that we've used a full bodied red variety, Shiraz and uh, mostly to produce this very unique sort of uh, medium sort of acidity, rich, red, sparkling, fun wine. So sort of, it's it's a bit niche right now. And the production of, of uh, Shiraz from uh, Sparkling Shiraz in Australia is kind of dwindled a fair bit, but it is a really important historical style. I've had wines from Sepples Great Western, as we talked about um, earlier. I've had wines from back in the 40s and 50s. And while the fizz might have sort of died in those wines, they were still absolutely magnificent and really ranked up there with some of the more exciting wines I've tried. Um, they range from off dry to really um, fruity and dry and very, very complex. And frankly, obviously really, really age worthy. The areas for sparkling reds in Australia, many, many areas that produce them, but there's a, a long history and tradition in Barossa, McLaren, Langhorn Creek, Coonawarra, obviously Great Western, also known as Grampians, with uh, um, Great Western, uh, Sepples Great Western in uh, in that particular region, rather Glen Yarra, a bunch of areas that are actually making good quality sparkling uh, reds, even though production is quite small. When it comes to the really high quality, mostly traditional method wines, everybody is raving about Tasmania, and I know Ed will talk about that. Adelaide Hills is a great place to source uh, fruit. Yarra Valley, obviously, where Mont Chandon are, are based. But there are all sorts of pockets of, um, generally speaking, very cool climate areas in Australia. And with that in mind, let's bring on Ed Carr. He's the chief winemaker for House of Arras, and we'll have a bit more of a chat about sparkling wine production in Australia. Good morning to you, Ed. Hello. 
Hi, Mark. How are you going? I'm doing well. Nice to see you. It's been a while yeah. since you uh, since we've uh, chatted sparkling wine, but I think you're, um, I don't know if you're 100% unique in Australia, but fairly unique in the sense that your entire career has been focused on sparkling wines. I know you've been at House of Arras since 1994, but your wine career started prior to that. What was it that made you go, okay, I'm going through winemaking school. This is where I'm going to head. I'm going to do sparkling wines. What was, what inspired you? Um, I don't know if it was fate or a or a destiny, but um, I actually have a degree in chemistry and microbiology, and that's the area that I started. Um, and I worked in the dairy industry for for a while, and then um, this is ancient history, realise. And then I went, um, I saw a, an exciting job in a laboratory for a small winery, which actually made sparkling wine at that point. And I still hadn't really moved on to the concept of making spark, sparkling wine. I um, I still saw myself as a white coat and a big glasses sort of person working in the laboratory. But being a small winery and being part of the Seaview Group at that point, which was a, a very large sparkling winemaker, traditional method sparkling winemaker at that point, um, I sort of naturally got more involved in the wine making and found that pretty interesting. And also being a microbiologist by trade, I guess, people assumed that I could um, fix any problems with secondary ferment. So it seemed a, it seemed a natural role just to move more and more into wine making. Um, I started a wine making course, but never actually completed it. Um, but, you know, that's um, history as well. So uh, sparkling wine for me was at the time very exciting and still and still is i mean when you think about it um you know with chardonnay and pinot noir only coming into australia like in the 70s um at that point this was in the 80s um we were seeing the exciting developments as you mentioned like shandon moving into the yarra valley what andrew Perry had done in tasmania with piper's river um there was just some really exciting stuff happening in sparkling wine from large volume commercial wines. The trend was becoming towards much higher quality, premium variety, premium, premium styles. And I thought, well, I, well, Australia's done well in lots of other styles some fortifieds and reds and was moving strongly into cooler climate styles as well with whites and reds. Why not have a crack at sparkling? Because I thought that's where the challenges would um, be. Oh, um, fantastic. And then you, uh, well, certainly, I mean, I've had some amazing sparkling wines from Australia and, and honestly, some of the best, not just because you're here, but some of the best sparkling wines I've had have been your wine, some of your vintage and some of your late disgorge wines from House of Arras. Now, you mentioned cool climate. Let's let's sort of circle around cool climate a bit here. Now, Tasmania, I know that you, you have a lot of fruit in some of your top wines that, that come from Tasmania. What is it about Tasmania that you think makes it so special and so sought after for sparkling wine? Yeah, for us, it was um, all part of the learning curve, I guess. We'd seen some early results from some true pioneers in Tasmania, like, as I said, the Perrys and the Wiltshires, um, the early work with Jantz and Rotorua. Um, but we really wanted to prove how good it could be uh, for our own style. So we'd actually made wines from a lot of cold climate regions in our own style. And in 95, when we first got access to some Tasmanian fruit, um, which eventually became ours, I mean, the concept was started in 94, but, you know, our first vintage was actually 95. The Tasmanian wine really stood out on its own as being something uniquely different. Uh, we thought it was good. We didn't realise how good it was at that stage. It's taken us 25 years to work um, that out. But... Um, <laughs> We really did uh, see just a fundamental shift in quality and style. Uh, I guess quality might not be the right word. It's style that we were that we were after. Um, with the original concept of the House of Arras, we didn't necessarily think it would be from a single region. We thought we might be blending wines from from over Australia, but we did find very quickly within Tasmania by '98 that. Um, the individual sub-regions that we sourced from gave us such diversity of blending options that we could remain within Tasmania entirely 
and um, still have enough wines to put a beautiful sort of matrix together of the blend. Which is the so, trick to great champagne, right? That's the. It's all about little um, uh, uh, individual parcels coming up to make the whole. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our, after vintage, you know, we come up with about 50 individual com components, some in stainless steel, some in oak, to put our wines together and spend the rest of the year doing that. So it really has become, you know, just exploded, sort of evolved from that original one wine to a, a group of six. But we've always maintained that um, multi-sub-regional approach and built on that. And we've learned so much about how the individual sub-regions uh, support the varieties differently and they, you know, um, historically are blended into the same products each year. Different sub-regions have different terroir that um, gives us different characters that um, allows us these great blending options. Um, now, you have sourced fruit from other areas. I mean, what are the other areas that you have enjoyed working with? Uh, you mentioned Macedon, but I know that you probably had fruit from Yarra and other parts in Victoria. What are other regions that you think are pretty specialised or, you know, exceptional for good sparkling wine in Australia? Well, Australia is, you know, as you know, a very large country. It has got great, great diversity. So um, we've actually made and still, still do because... House of Aris, part of the Accolade Group, we make sparkling wine from a lot of uh, cool climate regions within the country. Um, but they all have their individual terroir and they affect on styles. So you really need to choose which one you want to be in for the style that you want. But we've worked from Pemberton in Western Australia through the Adelaide Hills is still very strong for us and produces a lovely style, particularly up at Piccadilly in a very high country. It's mm -hmm. very, very cool through there. Yarra Valley is still very strong for us. Um, in the past, I've made some wines out of um, Macedon in Victoria and Tumbarumba in the high country in New South Wales. Also quite strong at the moment is wines out of Orange, which is in New South Wales, which is Great. probably the highest altitude vineyards in the country. Um, so all very different styles, but the one we chose for our top label, being being the House of Aris, by um, default became Tasmanian. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks, Ed. Now, okay, you now clearly you drink a lot of your own wines, but if you're drinking other people's wines in Australia, who do you, who else do you like as as a producer in Australia for high quality wines, sparkling wines? That is. Um, yeah, I favour the Tasmanians, and I'm going to miss some on those, so they'll get cross. Um, <laughs> But I'll That's talk okay. about some of the mainland ones as well. But um, outside of the group, um, I think Tamar Ridge is very strong. It's part of Brand, Brand Brothers Group. Uh, Jance has been a long, long player in the Tas Tasmanian scene. So um, Stefano Ljubljana, like a like a self-made man um, who started from almost nothing in southern Tasmania, has built a beautiful range, range of wines. Um, other wines are coming up strongly as well. Um, Brim Creek in Tas Tasmania has done recently well on the circuit. Um, yeah, so there's so many that I like. Um, yeah, I yeah tend to we're, see a lot of this. Uh, we're thrilled but, here because in the US, your the wines are starting to come <laughs> back in. I've just heard word that we're, they're, they're going to start coming into the US on a more frequent basis. We have Jance here, which is doing well, Clover Hills here, and I think there's some Tamo Ridge. So, we're starting to get a bit of solid Tasmanian representation here. So that's an exciting thing for us here in the US. But um, awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, Ed. Really appreciate it. Uh, illuminating uh, an, an area, a sector of, uh, of the wine business in Australia that probably people don't talk enough about. And, and hopefully that's going to change. And uh, thanks for all your insight in uh, sparkling wine and Tasmania specifically. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so when you think bubbles in Australia, remember the cool climate regions, Yarra Valley, Adelaide Hills, and specifically Tasmania. Think fun and affordable and also think classic and age-worthy. There's some amazing wines that you could put in the cellar and actually have and enjoy uh, decades later. And as I do, especially when I'm in Tasmania, think about a plate of freshly shucked oysters because sparkling wine from Tasmania and freshly shucked oysters, that's a winner.